question which we have is about uh, how to access the uh, data from remote databases using different protocols. Okay. So the question is how to access data from a remote database. Uh, we already covered JDBC. JDBC goes over a network, so it does not care where the database is. It could be on the same machine, it could be across the world as long as you are connected. Uh, so at the lowest level, JDBC or equivalent uh, protocols, uh, ODBC, uh, or a few other protocols are there, can be used to access data remotely. Uh, but there are uh, some things which uh, directly JDBC does not handle. Um, so there is some issues in updating, in atomically updating copies of data which are at remote places. And the area of distributed databases deals with a lot of these issues. Uh, we do not have time in this course to go into distributed databases. Uh, there is a chapter on it in the book. If you are interested, uh, you can read that up. Uh, but in this course, we do not have time for that. Does that answer your question? See, uh, there are uh, protocols like SOAP, uh, which can be used to uh, retrieve data from uh, remote database if the other end they give permission for us to retrieve. So, okay. could you please explore more on that? Okay. okay. Thanks for that question. So, I, I see what you are saying. Uh, now, when we directly talk to a database, it is at a very low level. Uh, so, I interpreted your question as talking to a database directly. However, uh, very often you do not want to expose the low level details of the database, including the schema, but you want to provide some functionality which you can access remotely. And the area of uh, web services uh, is based on this idea. So, the idea is uh, if you heard of remote procedure calls, it is basically the same thing. Uh, the idea is that you can invoke a procedure which runs on a machine somewhere else, it generates results and then sends it back to you. Now, in order to execute that remote procedure, it may fetch data from a database, it may write data to a database, but that is orthogonal. So, the idea is that instead of directly providing access to data, you build a layer of software on top and let uh, applications invoke the software through what look like procedure calls. So, this a idea is called, uh, has come up around in various incarnations. Uh, SOAP is one such protocol or it is called web services. So, web services basically was a way as some, there were several standards defined where you use HTTP to execute a remote procedure call somewhere and you use XML representation to send and get data back. So, that was the plan and many services do it that way. These days, uh, for certain services, the overhead of dealing with XML schema and so on is a kind of a pain. So, many applications provide something which are uh, sometimes called web service light. What they do is, they use this representation called JavaScript object notation or JSON, which is tightly integrated with the JavaScript language. So, they can make a call sending a data through back in, in using JavaScript objects. The thing executes, generates a result, sends a result back also using JavaScript objects. And uh, some of these have been made very simple through what is called uh, REST or representational state transfer, which basically means, in short, what it means is instead of defining a complex API, I can define uh, basically a, something like a URL and then say that pass these parameters and I will execute and return the results in typically in JSON. So, it makes it easier to write applications which talk to a remote side, get something executed and get data back. If you think about it, a servlet is basically doing something like this, except that the assumption is that a human is entering data and clicking submit, the servlet executes, gives it back to a human. Now, what we want is the thing on this side may not be a human, it is an application program. In fact, it may be a program running on your own browser. or it may be a program running on this server, which needs to get data from another server to complete its task. So, uh, this is quite widely used these days. Um, so, there is a whole uh, 
uh, area of how to architect applications using these services or web services as a building block. This is called service oriented architecture or SOA. There is a lot of activity on standards and architectures in this space, conferences and so on. So, software engineering people are paying a lot of attention to these things in these days. And the other thing is that once you have a cloud, meaning you have computers sitting somewhere else which are doing your work, um, in order to do any work, you have to communicate with them from your application. So, it is very important to have this services defined, so that uh, your application program can use all these services to get some work done. So, there is being used increasingly these days. I, does that answer your question? I think we will take a few questions from chat at this point. Mm. How is session information stored in Tomcat? So, how do you store session information? Tomcat is basically uh, running as a process. It has uh, some area of the memory which is devoted to storing session information. So, there is uh, surely a hash table in there. The cookie is would be the hash key. So, given the cookie which the browser gives back, it looks up that table using the key, gets the session object and then makes that session object available to the uh, servlet. When you do session dot get attribute, it is actually fetching a thing which is stored inside a session object. So, that is straightforward. The next question is, uh, can we run different um, databases on the same server? Can you run Postgres and MySQL on the same server? Absolutely. The only thing to make sure is that they do not run on the same port. All of them listen on a particular port, so that incoming requests will go to that port. Now, each database has a default listen port, which is which they have made sure will not conflict. So, Oracle has I think 1521, PostgreSQL has 5432, MySQL I do not remember the number. So, if you just take the default configuration, they will just run with no problem. In fact, you can run two PostgreSQL databases on the same machine. Uh, many, very often uh, during development of PostgreSQL internals, uh, we need to do that. We have uh, modified PostgreSQL and it will run on a different port, but that is not a problem. You can have multiple PostgreSQLs on the same machine. Okay. Next question, what is the limit on data stored in a session? I do not think there is a predefined limit, uh, but if you store too much stuff, your memory is going to get filled up on the machine. Uh, related question from the same place is, what is the session handling capacity of Tomcat? Again, I do not know what is the limit, but uh, I do not think there is any hard limit. Uh, you can store a lot of sessions in Tomcat. Next question, what is the difference between thin, thick and smart client? A thin client is a browser. A thick client was the old, uh, you know, thing where you have to l run an application program on the user's machine, and it talks to a database behind. So that is a thick client. Now these terms, uh, this is the original usage. Nowadays they are not as well defined, for the simple reason that uh, even Gmail is no longer a very simple, very thin client because it's loading JavaScript and running it on the browser. Uh, I do not know what uh, you refer to as smart client, um, perhaps this is what it means, but I am not sure, I have not seen the term myself. Next question is, uh, you said HTTP is connectionless, then how come request response or client server synchronization will take place? Okay, I see that connectionless was a confusing term. Uh, it is actually a badly chosen name. Connectionless does not mean there is no connection. What it means is the connections are not going to live for a long time. A connection is made for a request. The request has some handshake back and forth. When the request has been satisfied, the connection can be closed. So, it is not really connectionless, it is connection short, short connections. Uh, so, synchronization, the back and forth all happens on that connection. And when the particular request has been resolved, then the connection is closed. In fact, uh, these days m most web servers will keep a connection around for a little while, so that if another request comes immediately, they will reuse the connection instead of opening a brand new connection. So, the, for a few seconds at least, the connection will be kept alive. 
Uh, with that, I think I'll stop. We are well beyond time, and uh, we will break here. And as I was saying uh, earlier, I would welcome any questions and feedback. I see that a few people have uh, raised their flag. Uh, I see Samrat, Ashok, uh, Vidisha. If you have any comments, please go ahead. You're on now. Sir, uh, this program on database management system is quite good and very beneficial for us. Actually, this is my personal view that I couldn't uh, take uh, DBMS as a fa my favorite subject, but after attending these classes, I get in confidence for this subject. And it is quite very good, sir. Thank you very much, sir, and over to you, sir. Thank you for the feedback. Let's see if anybody else has uh, any feedback. I, by the way, I welcome uh, any uh, suggestions on any changes that you want in this course or also on any topics you would like to see covered in the advanced uh, topics uh, coverage, which is on the last day of the course. So let's see if anybody else has their hands up. I see uh, Indore having the flag up. Indore, I'm going to connect you through. Yeah, Indore. Please go ahead. Sir, can you explain what is the main difference between NP hard and NP, NP complete problems? Okay. So the question is, what is the difference between NP hard and NP complete problems? Uh, that is uh, slightly outside the scope of a database course and is very much in the scope of an algorithm course. Uh, but since uh, several people are curious, uh, let me answer this question. So, uh, first of all, what is uh, the, how difficult is a particular problem? It's a basic question which uh, algorithms people uh, were uh, looking at for a long time. And then in the 70s, a very interesting result came about from uh, Cook, uh, who later uh, won the Turing Award for this. And the basic idea was this. You know, people already knew that certain algorithms, uh, certain problems could be solved in quadratic time, certain could be done in n log n, but there were a class of problems for which people could not find algorithms which took less than exponential time. Uh, for example, uh, if you have, uh, uh, there is a classic problem known as traveling salesman problem and to solve that problem on a graph with n uh, nodes and vertices. Uh, any algorithm which was known took only uh, took at least time 2 power n. Nobody was able to do it faster than that. So, the idea was uh, can we show that these problems are intrinsically hard? And interestingly, even uh, today, uh, nearly uh, 40 years after the initial result of Cook, nobody has actually been able to show that these are intrinsically hard. It is a really fundamental problem uh, which is still open today after all these years. However, what Cook showed was something very interesting. He showed there is a class of problems for which uh, if you can guess the answer, then you can verify it in polynomial time. Of course, that does not mean you can get the answer in polynomial time. You can verify the answer in polynomial time. That is the idea. And in order to guess this, there were an exponential number of choices for these problems. So, if you had exponential time, you could try each of those choices and then check uh, if it was optimal and in the end you have the answer that you wanted. So, we know it can be solved in exponential time, but um, the uh, even the verification takes polynomial time and actually solving it in less than exponential time, it is not clear if it can be done. And what Cook showed is that there is a whole class of problems which are equivalent and these are equivalent to uh, a set of problems, uh, there is another very well known problem called the 3 sat problem. But let us not get into the details. The bottom line is for all these problems, they are said to be NP complete because we know that we can verify the answer in polynomial time and uh, uh, further they are all equivalent. If you can solve one problem in polynomial time, you can solve the other in polynomial time, but nobody has figured out how to solve any of these problems in polynomial time. So, it is believed generally that the best you can do with these problems is exponential time, although nobody has actually proved it yet. So, NP complete is a class of problems uh, which are, which have all been shown to be equivalent here, 
meaning that we can solve them in uh, exponential time for sure. And maybe if any one of these problems can be solved faster, we can solve that one also faster. N p hard says that, you know, uh, it is at least as hard to solve as one of these problems, but perhaps it is harder to solve. There are problems which will uh, most probably take even more time than N p uh, complete problem. So, N p hard is usually it is used in the following sense. I have a problem and even if I do not yet have a solution, uh, which can be uh, you know a, a way to verify the solution in polynomial time. If I could and there are exp exponential number of solutions, I would say it is N p complete. If I do not have that, but I can say that this problem is at least as hard computationally in terms of amount of time it takes as any one of these n p complete problems, then we say it is n p hard. It is at least as hard as n p. It may be harder. We have not yet shown anything about this particular problem. So, such problems are called n p hard. Usually what happens is initially uh, you take a problem and uh, say it is n p hard. It is easy to, uh, very often it is easy to show it is n p hard. To show it is n p complete, you still need to do a little bit more work. And sometimes we, uh, we just say casually it is n p hard. Uh, without bothering to uh, explain whether it is actually n p complete or it is not. Most problems uh, you know in the slides which I used, I may have mentioned n p hard a few times. Uh, most of those problems are uh, probably n p complete, uh, but the point of mentioning n p hardness was to say that uh, these do not have a very cheap polynomial solution and um, we just left it at that, uh, but most of them are in fact n p complete. I hope that answers your question. Back to you if you have any follow up questions. Oops, I can take a few more questions. Uh, Valchand and shoot, over to you. Uh, from cshop.net, which adapter or which driver interface you recommend? Uh, I am sorry, could you repeat that question? The, it got cut in the middle. Can you repeat it from the beginning? Sir. Ha, sir. So, connecting from C sharp dot net program. Yeah. Which program or interface you recommend? Which driver? Which driver? A driver or interface do you recommend to do what? Yes, yes. Uh, accessing the data in Oracle. An Oracle? Okay. So, the question is if you want to access the Oracle database, uh, which driver should you be using? Uh, Oracle provides a driver uh, called uh, the JDBC thin driver uh, that is uh, good enough uh, for all our purposes. Uh, so, uh, there is a corresponding class file which you can download from the Oracle site and uh, so you have to load that uh, into your uh, Eclipse or NetBeans and uh, that provides the JDBC thin driver and you can use that. Does that answer your question? I want to talk from C sharp program to Oracle. Okay, C sharp program to Oracle. So, uh, I am not sure what are the drivers for C sharp. I am sure Oracle provides it. Uh, I have not used uh, uh, C sharp to connect to Oracle. So, I do not know the answer directly, but it should be easy enough to find the uh, driver uh, by doing a bit of web search. Okay, so one more question. Hello. Yeah. So, my question is can you uh, give us a brief idea about Hadoop technology? Okay. The question is can you tell us a bit about Hadoop? Uh, uh, thanks for the suggestion. Uh, what I am going to do is on uh, the last day when I have an advanced uh, topics, uh, what I will do is uh, I will uh, certainly cover a little bit about uh, MapReduce uh, including Hadoop and about uh, big table and uh, uh, equivalent uh, very large scale distributed data storage systems, because both of these technologies are seeing increased use in uh, building very large scale web applications. So, uh, that is certainly something which many people would be interested in and I will cover it on the last day. Any other uh, questions or suggestions from your side? Okay. Side? Thank you, sir. Over to you. Okay. But let me say just a few uh, sentences about Hadoop. For those of you who are wondering what is this uh, thing called Hadoop, uh, since somebody asked that question. Basically, uh, when you have a highly parallel systems for processing very large volumes of data, 
traditionally parallel databases have been used. Uh, they have been around for a very long time. Parallel databases uh, were first built in the uh, early 80s, both in academia and in industry. So, now they have been around um, all through the 90s, at least 25 uh, years now that they have been around. And people have been using them for analyzing very large volumes of data. Uh, but there is another community which found that they needed to process data which was not actually in databases, they were in files and they needed to do uh, in many cases more complex uh, processing of that uh, data than the SQL language supports directly. So, what they did is they built a parallel uh, programming infrastructure uh, which lets you uh, first of all uh, divide up the data files across machines and then run a job in parallel across all the machines and then collect the results from the individual machines and aggregate them to get a single final answer. Okay. So, this paradigm was called map and reduce. Map means you break up the problem into pieces, process them parallelly. Reduce means that you collect the results from all the things and reduce the local results into one single final result. So, this is a map reduce paradigm. And, uh, MapReduce again was uh, proposed probably uh, 30, 40 years back uh, when parallel uh, processing uh, first uh, became uh, you know possible and was uh, researched extensively. However, uh, it has become very widespread in recent years because the amount of data which people have to deal with has exploded and uh, people started writing programs, parallel programs which ran fine when you had uh, maybe 10, 20 machines. But when your scale is 1000 machines, there are serious problems which start to arise. First of all, when you have a 10 or 20 machines, most of the time all the machines will be up. If you have 50 machines, many of you have labs in your uh, colleges uh, with 50 to 100 machines, I am sure. And you know that at least a few of the machines will be dead at any point of time. Of course, these are machines which students abuse uh, and uh, pull plugs and do various things. But even if you put all those 50 machines in a controlled room, in a rack and so forth, 50 machines will have failures every now and then. Whereas, if you scale to 1000, you are going to have a lot of failures. And then when in the face of all these failures, running a computation becomes very difficult. And what uh, the MapReduce implementations which are available these days such as Hadoop do is, uh, they uh, will make sure that even if a machine fails, some other machine will take over and uh, finish the computation and they offer a very nice infrastructure for parallelizing tasks, uh, you know easily 1000, even 10,000 way parallelism is possible with this infrastructure. And so, that is increasingly in use and I will tell you a little bit about it on the last day. Okay, so, that is it for that question.